ladies and gentlemen, I'm Conservation Officer with the Amalgamating City and County Council for Limerick. Uh, Eliza O'Grady, who will be speaking after me, is turn and turn about the daughter, half-sister and aunt of the O'Grady of his clan, so there's nobody more uh, entitled to speak on the history of the O'Grady's. And then Catherine O'Brien is an up-and-coming uh, conservation architect based in East County Limerick. And the reason I've chosen this format is to emphasize a message that is coming through, I think, both from yesterday afternoon sessions and this morning already, is the partnership uh, approach and the profits that can come for our built heritage by taking that approach where various different people, various different institutions lend something in the uh, greater, uh, uh, for the benefit of the greater good. So Nakaini is a small village here in uh, eastern part of Limerick there and uh, it is a small but vibrant community and there can-do attitude, I think, has, has uh, resulted in being given international, uh, or sorry, national recognition by uh, becoming the Pride of Place national winner in 2012. Um, it's an ancient place. It is one of the earliest place names mentioned in the annals, with dates going to back to 646 and uh, periods of, of that era. Um, the Annals of Inish Fallon tell us that in uh, 646, Mors Ingesse Le O Anya Ich Glenaman, which translates as Death of Angus Leah, the Grey, from Anya at Glenaman. And in 667, the same Annals tells us that Nakani itself was the site of conflict, the Battle of Anya, in which Oganon, son of Conmail, king of the Ichrafri, fell. That's how the, the entry translates. Now, there is the hill that gives its name to the village, not gain. And sorry about the quality of the slide, it hasn't come out too well. There is the crossroads at which we find the church that we'll be looking at later. But down here, west of Kilmallock, is a small little rise in the land. And that's the oldest place name in County Limerick. And I mention it because it is Knoch Sauna, the Hill of Sauen. And it is the only record in Ireland of a place associated with Sauen, the ancient Celtic festival of the dead, celebrated worldwide now as Halloween. And I think that's a, a significant part of, of uh, the county's heritage. And the date that that occurs in Anala Origanach's Erin, the Annals of the Four Masters, is 241. And again, we have Kassawan Hitochachin Eileilach Olun, the Battle of Saun in which fell Cian, the son of Olul Olum. So I think it's pretty clear from these ancient references that you basically had to die or be the site of much slaughter, which is a phrase often used um, to get a mention in the ancient histories of Ireland. And um, the advantage of that is, I suppose, is that their, lives na their, their names liveth forevermore um, beyond the grave. Um, Lewis, in his topographical dictionary of the 1830s, spoke of Nagaini as being the site of a preceptory of the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem, one of the uh, military orders of knights, in this case a, a knight's hospitaller uh, order, and their land holdings would appear to have stretched from hospital, which takes its name from their primary foundation, all the way west to Nakaini, about four kilometres to, to the west, and then further perhaps to Kilbalion, <coughs> the place of John, the form of own uh, being reserved for princes and chieftains, saints and, and other notables. So perhaps that's a, another connection. And it's a highly significant place, the, the little Church of Ireland dedicated to St. John, um, 
when the newly appointed Minister for Heritage uh, took a tour of the county, uh, Jimmy Deanahan, three years ago or so, the Heritage Officer, my colleague Tom O'Neill, brought Mr Deanahan here to uh, Kilbalio or to, to Knockany and to St John's. It's featured in a recent publication dealing with uh, reuse of redundant churches published by uh, the Ulster uh, Architectural Historical Society and it has featured on the front cover of the advice series of uh, books that are produced on appropriate conservation measures by the Department of Arts and Heritage. Uh, the graveyard that surrounds the uh, church has been surveyed by the local community and this is the plan uh, showing the, uh, the layout of tombs and vaults and, and headstones and other memorials and you can see here um, the sort of layers of barrel vaults that are found at the eastern end. Uh, this, pardon me, back, this here is the tomb that will be uh, talked about by Catherine later on. But just to point out that basically, I'll, mm, wrong way, yeah. There, 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 here and here, here and uh, elsewhere are vaults and mausolea and, and uh, iron fenced uh, graves of members of the O'Grady family. And this is just a selection of some of those uh, tombs and vaults and markers. This is the oldest tomb recently uncovered in uh, the graveyard within the footprint of an earlier church on the site and it dates to 1618. Uh, oh good God, what have I hit? <laughs> There now, it's over and done with there. Um, and just some of the uh, O'Grady tombs. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to Eliza. <coughs> I don't know what you have. Um, uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Eliza O'Grady. And um, the O'Grady family has been, I suppose, a living or based in County Limerick since the 14th century. Prior to that, they were based in County Clare near Tomb Graney, Mount Shannon area, Holy Island, um, but they were defeated by the O'Briens, and fortunately for them, they had already established a base in County Limerick through marriage to um, a daughter of O'Kerwick, and o the O'Kerwick family lived at Kilbalioan, and um, so since the 14th century, the O'Grady family have had a, a base. The main seat of the O'Grady family in Ireland has been at uh, Kilbalio in County Limerick, which is very close to Narcany, about two miles away. And all of the members of the, the, that family have been buried in this graveyard, um, including my own parent, my father, and most recently my uncle, who died last year in 93, was actually buried in one of the vaults. My father didn't really want to go into one himself. but. Um, but then, um, so Kilbalion was the main seat, and they have um, the vault on the right. Well, we can't see it in the picture. It's on the right, but it's, yes. Down in a hollow it's, there. It, it's, it's, it's almost on the ground. Yeah, it's and that, that is the, um, that's what appears on the top, and it's, the dedication is to S. de Corsi O'Grady, um, Standish de Corsi O'Grady, who would have been my great-grandfather. And uh, if you look at the history of the O'Grady family, Standish O'Grady is a name that appears over and over and over and over again. There are many, many Standish O'Grady's, and it actually becomes um, somewhat confusing. But um, that vault is for the family who were based in Kilbalio, and, and they were the, the sort of the, the senior branch of the O'Grady family. But over the years, they spread out through the county, and um, another line of the family that um, distinguished themselves actually um, almost more so than the Kilbalio branch were the Gillamore O'Grady's. And um, they set up, they were based in not very far away from Bruff in Car Gillamore. And um, another, it was another, a second son of the, the, the family living in Kilbaleo and who he moved, they moved over to Car Gillamore and another big house right next door called Mount Prospect, which is also known as um, Rock Barton. And um, one of the Standish O'Grady's in that line, the Gillamore line, was, became Viscount Gillamore. He distinguished himself up in Dublin as a barrister and... Um, he, in fact, became the Attorney General and also uh, was 
prosecuted Robert, Robert Emmett, poor Robert Emmett. Um, he was known as the bloody judge because I think he um, sent people to the, the uh, to be hung um, very readily for sort of minor offenses. Um, so not someone I really want to remember that fondly. But he's buried in St. John's, um, in the graveyard in St. John's, in the largest uh, mausoleum, which is the one here. Um, behind the tree, and um, yes, and this would be the crest of, this is the, the family crest of the Gillimore O'Grady line. And then again, they spread out through, you know, that Standish O'Grady, the first Viscount, had many, many children, and um, one of his younger sons set up uh, in Castle Guard. They, they bought, Waller O'Grady was his name, and they bought uh, another, it's another house um, over near Kappa Moor, which still exists actually. Um, it's uh, been, it, it's a, a Norman tower, and there is a descendant of the O'Grady's living there through marriage, David Thompson. Um, and there is then the, another mausoleum that Catherine's going to talk about, the Edward Stammer O'Grady mausoleum, the connection there. They're all cousins sort of through the Gillimore line. Um, he became a well-known surgeon in Dublin. And so, you know, I suppose they, those who had quite a lot of money felt it was a fashion of the time to build these mausolea. And um, yes, this is the Edward Stammer O'Grady mausoleum before the renovation started several, two, two or three years ago. Um, it was in a terrible state, trees growing through the roof. Um, we were very lucky, in fact, to, to get funding, and Catherine's going to talk about that in a minute. Um, so basically, the O'Grady family is well established in County Limerick, and um, still living, a number of us still living here. I live at Kilbaleo and still, and um, still use the graveyard, uh, for better or for worse. <laughs> I don't know if there's anything else I need to say. I'll hand over to Catherine now, who's going to talk about the conservation. Good morning. Um, I was retained in 2011 as the project architect to oversee the restoration or restoration conservation of this mausoleum. Um, it's defined as a stately or impressive building housing a tomb or a group of tombs. And in this case, it's a group of, uh, of tombs internally. This is what I found in late 2011. Um, this is the entrance elevation, and you'll see that the entrance door was blocked up with uh, mass concrete, or poured shuttered concrete. Um, the buttresses on the corners uh, were, had disengaged almost completely, less so on the sheltered sides. And uh, some of these roof slabs were actually on the ground. You'll see them down here in the bottom of the photograph. Um, vegetative growth had been excessive, water ingress. Um, internally, we don't have a photograph of it in this slides, but there was a lovely brick uh, arch which has survived very, very well. So the worst things were the, the, the buttresses. The main structure wasn't bad. Um, so where did I start? I started with, um, sorry, these are the disengaged buttresses you'll see, and you'll see the ivy there, how strong it has, and it's literally pushed out the buttresses from the structure it's supposed to be uh, supporting. This is the very apex You'll see some later addition, <coughs> well-meaning uh, repairs, but cementitious repairs which were inappropriate, and they would have caused more damage because the different strengths and pulling the building apart. S start always m measuring, recording, photographing every single detail, and then you have a record of how it was, and that will inform you how to put it back together again. So that's, that's critical. So we started. Uh, measured it, drew it, photographed it. We then went out to tender and we only selected very sensitive contractors who knew what they were at. Um, and so we engaged the services of Irish Natural Stone Limited and they began the lengthy process of literally taking all the pieces back down to the ground, labeling them, and each piece was numbered on a, on a face that would be put back in so you wouldn't see it. So we're, we didn't damage any of the external exposed faces. Uh, this is during the repairs. You'll see where we 
tried to repair always rather than replace. So we, where we could, we spliced in little bits of, of stone as opposed to taking away the entire piece. Where they were missing, we had to replace. Also line pointing, uh, appropriate to the original mix. So this is the end result. Um, the color obviously will, will fade down in these with weathering. But we've managed to consolidate all of this and, and keep it vital for generations to come, hopefully. Um, this is the front facade. That infill panel you see up there, when we took that away, we had originally hoped to put in a steel door or an iron door. The costs were prohibitive. When we took out that concrete, we actually found inside, in the chamber, all the original ironmongery and parts of the old wood door. So that informed us it was actually wood in the first place. And within the community, they had a brilliant uh, joiner, Dick Carl. He came on board and he helped us uh, make up a new door befitting of the structure. We were able to, um, the slide doesn't really show, but there's a lovely metal grill that allows circulation of air in and out. And there we go. All of that was inside with the, with the coffins or with the, and all these big oversized hinges and the lock, wasn't the lock there? Internally, yeah, it's on the other side. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, <coughs> we reused everything we could and uh, this is what we've now got. So that's it. Um, just to, to a parallel across the, the millennia, I'm often asked, how come so many O'Grady's are there? brought back from Dublin and, and um, elsewhere. And I liken it very quickly to a theory put forward by the Swedish archeologist, Jörn Björnholt, who excavated in the Caramore area of Sligo in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and is coming back, I gather, for another season. And he looks to the origins of stone-built burial places as a reflection of the transient nature and cyclical nature of the hunter-fisher gatherers of the Mesolithic period. And they were hunting on the slopes of Knock for certain times of the year, fishing in Loch Gill and along the banks of the river that flows out of there, and gathering uh, shellfish on um, the slopes, of, uh, I'm sorry, in, in Ballastadair Bay and elsewhere. And, uh, I think that there's a deep need for us to have a place of permanent rest in our lives and we seek a central location for that and that's what gave rise in the area at the centre of that area of activity for the megalithic tombs of the proto-megalithic period and I'm going to finish there. Thank you.